Hello and welcome to bonding valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Let's kick it off talking about the theory itself. <clears throat> People call it Vesper. That's because Vesper is hard to say. Um, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory is basically the idea that pairs of bonding and non-bonding electrons around the central atom uh, repel one another. They're all negatively charged, uh, the bonds themselves, and electron pairs also. And so since they're negatively uh, charged, they repel each other maximally, as far as they possibly can. Now, bonds may be of slightly different construct. Electron pairs are held very cl closely to the atom, where bonds are, depending on the bond, distributed somewhere in between the two atoms. So there's lots of different things going on. But generally speaking, we have some large predictability, and that's what we're going to hang on to. Um, these are electrostatic forces, obviously. Um, in a molecule, electrostatic forces between pairs of electrons cause them to move as far as possible away from each other as they can, given the other forces that are there. Um, there are lots of different bond angles possible. Uh, the specific bond angles are not our focus, but the, ge the general idea of the bond angles is. And so we're going to see molecules of different shape, linear shapes, bent shapes, trigonal shapes, tetrahedral three-dimensional shapes, and more. Um, keep in mind, and these are our Lewis structures we just learned to draw, bonding groups are bonded atoms, okay? Non-bonding pairs of electrons are pairs of electrons that are not used in bonding with a different atom. The shapes are, are, are built on um, the actual atoms themselves, also known as the molecular geometry. The shapes we see, this is a linear shape, a bent shape, a trigonal planar shape, a tetrahedral shape. There's also behind it, if there were electrons bound to these central atoms, there's also an electron pair geometry. If we could add an additional um, position for where electrons are, there's an, a, a different um, geometry shape too, if we consider not just the bonds, but also the electron pairs. So we'll keep that in mind as we go through the shapes. So what this is, is a document you should already have, or you'll be getting in class, um, and we'll be, make clear what you're expected to know uh, some of this happens in this video, some in a future video, but big idea is that you'll be you'll be directed to specifically what's expected for you to remember. Um, first things first, when we have a central atom with two bound species on either side and no pairs of electrons stuck to the central atom, we call it a linear shape um, and a linear electron pair geometry. Notice there's no electrons around here, so there's only this linear shape totally. Both electron pair and molecular geometry are linear. That's when you have two bonded pairs. These could be a triple bond and a single bond, two double bonds, two single bonds, doesn't matter. They're all linear. I remember a bond doesn't matter if it's two electrons or six electrons in between, it's a single bond. Um, or it's a bond. Sorry, not a single bond. It could be a triple bond, double bond, but they're all one bond. When there are two atoms and one pair of electrons, you see we have this electron pair exerting a different force here. Um, it forces the, these two bonding pairs downward. So imagine that we stuck a pair of electrons here. It would force these two downwards, repelling them like um, uh, a, 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 a balloon rubbed on your head makes your hairs repel each other. So we call that a trigonal planar electron pair geometry. In other words, it's, it's got three poles, and it's flat if you laid it on a table. Uh, but the molecular geometry, ignoring this pair of electrons, is bent. Bond angles make sense here. It's 180 degrees straight across here. It's a straight geometry. And it's a little less than 120 degrees between these bonded pairs. Now, when this bond here is referring to the distance between two bonds. So this is less than 120 compared to the next one down here because this electron pair is closer to the, the central atom than the bonds are, so it exerts a greater downward force. And then we move to the next species. It's got three bonded atoms around a central atom. Trigonal planar, trigonal planar, again, is flat on the table, okay? So mac, uh, maximal, uh, rep maximum repulsion leads to 120-degree bond angle, exactly assuming these three things are identical. Now, examples are given here. Bond angles are given here. Notice lone pairs exert a greater force than a bonded atom. That's because they're closer to the central atom. Notice that in atoms that have zero lone pairs, the electron pair and the molecular geometry are the same. Notice that as you start adding lone pairs, the, the uh, molecular ge geometry does not match electron pair geometry. We also have hybridization here. We'll get to that soon in the video. We also have uh, not not uh, best for not best uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory notation. This is not necessary to memorize. 
it is necessary to understand because we may communicate in that type. If we have um, four things around the central atom, four electron regions, uh, two bonding, two lone pairs, we have, this is essentially water shape. We have a tetrahedral shape for all three of these. Um, but we should note here that our, our molecular geometry is bent again. Our three-dimensional shape, though, is tetrahedral. And when you have three and one, you notice we still have that tetrahedral electron pair geometry, but we have what's called a trigonal pyramidal shape for the three-dimensional shape, ignoring electron pair. Notice the bond angles for both of these are less than 109.5. This one's more, uh, even greater, uh, smaller bond angle here than these are because these pairs of electrons exert a greater force than this single pair of electron does. But you don't really need to know the exact uh, values. Um, when all species are around that central atom are the same, we would expect 109.5 exactly. Um, let's see. And now we're moving into expanded octets. And really all we need you to know here is the general uh, five electron uh, domains around the central atom is trigonal bipyramidal. And that shape looks like this. There's a central triangle here, trigonal planar in the middle, along the equatorial axis. And then on the um, axial plane, we have this up and down plane. We have a, a 180 or... Uh, sorry, 90 degrees here and 90 degree here bond angle. Um, really, it, on these, you don't need to know anything more than the trigonal pyramidal shape. We will discuss some specificities about the interesting nature of this shape, the bond angles therein, and there's examples on the side. You do not need to know the exact molecular geometry. We're not going to ask you these. We may have you draw them, though. We may have you draw Lewis structures. We won't make you predict molecular geometry necessarily. Then finally, when you have six electron domains around the central atom, you have an octahedral shape. Um, and instead of having a trigonal planar around the central atom, you have a square planar, and then you have, again, the uh, axial plane up and down. So um, the examples abound. We'll be doing a lot of these in class where we draw the Lewis structure and with our, our paper predict the shapes. Um, but as far as assessments go, you're only held to up to the tetrahedral um, electron pair and molecular geometries by, by uh, memory. So the green, you don't have to memorize exactly. We do, we will work with them though. So starting with Lewis structure, going down to shape. When we have something like carbon dioxide, we have two bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. The electron pair geometry is linear. Molecular shape is also linear. Notice I didn't draw anything here. We don't need to be able to draw the three-dimensional shapes. This is not a class that needs you to be able to draw. When you get to organic chem, you'll do plenty of that. Um, water, we have the shape that we're very familiar with. We have two bonding pairs and two lone pairs. The electron pair geometry is tetrahedral, but the shape is bent. Boron tri trihydride, one of our exceptions to the octet rule, we have three bonded pairs and no uh, electrons. That's trigonal planar. That's the flat, the triangular shape, the, D the Dorito, uh, if you're into the Doritos, if you get a perfect one. Ammonia, we have one pair of electrons and three bonded pairs. Also tetrahedral electron pair geometry, but a pyramidal or trigonal pyramidal uh, molecular shape. Then methane, um, four bonded pairs, zero electrons, tetrahedral, tetrahedral. This is the idea. This is what you need to be able to produce given a formula uh, and up to the four electron pair domains. Um, as far as things with five and six electron pair domains, we will be drawing Lewis structures. We might ask you how many electron pairs are around the central atom, but we won't ask you the specific names of all the shapes. Okay, molecular polarity is another huge topic for us because this predicts a lot of the behavior of molecules. We have to be able to understand the behavior. This is why we're in this course. Um, molecular polarity uh, is uh, based on a couple of things. First of all, molecules that are symmetrical are generally nonpolar. Now, that's not perfect, but something like carbon dioxide, even though you might say, hey, that's a polar bond. Um, the fact that we have two uh, diametrically opposed polar bonds leads to an overall nonpolar molecule. Same thing is true of carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is tetrahedral. So when there's maximal repulsion in all angles, even if you have a polar bond in each uh, um, direction, as long as they're equal, it's nonpolar. Now, asymmetry can stem from different atoms across bonds. And, and when you know with asymmetry, we may have an atom that has a different electronegativity, electronegativity difference here, and that can create the polar molecule. So instead of having carbon tetrachloride, we might have um, something like this, which is CHCl3, also known as formaldehyde. This compound is completely chemically different from this, and part of it is due to that difference in that single bond right there. And it creates a polarity across this molecule that makes it act differently than carbon tetrachloride does. 
Um, we're so used to drawing these shapes, and here's a tetrahedral molecule. This is a space occupying model of carbon tetrachloride, and the little dark blue is the electron dense areas on the molecule. It's kind of neat looking to see something as a shape that, you know, who knows, someday in the future we might actually see something similar to that in a microscope. Um, asymmetry can arise from central atoms containing asymmetrical electron pairs. So this is ammonia. Now you see three what appear to be um, perfectly opposed bonds, but there's this electron pair here. And what that electron pair right there makes this a very polar molecule. Okay, so when you look at it, you see this electron pair up top. That's going to make it imbalanced. Now here's some unique ones for you. These are um, compounds that uh, that are breaking the octet rule of two different noble gas molecules. And what you need to know about these two, very interestingly, is these are both nonpolar. Nonpolar not because it's got different uh, items here. These electron pairs are diametrically opposed just like these fluorine are. So you imagine about the central atom of this xenon, we have a square planar fluorine, and then coming up out of the page and going down into the page, we have two pairs of electrons. The krypton difluoride, we have uh, essentially that tr trigonal bipyramidal shape where we have a triangle of electron pairs around the central atom, this would actually be linear. So this diagram is very misleading. Nevertheless, if we know our shapes, we know that this, this shape is likely to have a uh, trigonal planar across the equatorial axis of this krypton and then an axial plane um, or a cross plane on this page, you would have the two fluorine bonds. Now, do we need to know that one exactly and this one exactly? No, but we would need to be able to take information that would lead us to believe that we have uh, a pair of electrons that would make it polar and then report accordingly. This concludes bonding three valent shell electron pair repulsion theory. You should have taken high quality notes. Please rewatch this video as you need and buy, the more you learn, the more questions you better have. We expect you to talk to us in class about anything that might come up based on this video. See you there. there.